Good morning. So welcome to uh, UVITIS Subspecialty Day Rounds. The uh, title of our uh, presentation are uh, Infectious Posterior UV Disease Diagnoses Not to Miss. Uh, we are going to present uh, some common posterior UV disease that are vision threatening, some uncommon ones that are definitely ocular emergencies, and some more unusual posterior UV disease, and some that are ubiquitous and you should always test for. So really the question that you need to ask yourself when you're confronted with a patient that you think is, has inflammation in their eye is, is it infectious or is it not? This is a very important question. And this is answered really through an accurate and thorough history, uh, and complete ophthalmic and physical examination. And then, of course, the key is the formulation of differential diagnosis. And then laboratory testing and or intraocular fluid sampling is used to confirm or exclude the diagnosis uh, of certain infections or non-infectious diseases. There are certain key considerations. Those are the exposure risks, for example, sexually transmitted diseases, HIV status, tuberculosis exposures, systemic illnesses. These are things that you would glean on your uh, examination review of systems, constitutional symptoms, organ, other organ system involvement, um, the nutritional status of the patient, and their, their immune status, so whether or not this is acquired. Um, or iatrogenic or uh, through age. As, as we age, uh, our immune status wanes a little bit. And then, of course, local factors including uh, recent surgery and trauma. The anatomic location of the uh, uveitis is uh, extremely important, particularly with respect to where in the back of the eye, what tissue is involved. For example, is it a retinitis, as you might see in a patient with a necrotizing herpetic retinitis, or is it a choroiditis, say, for example, where TB would more uh, commonly present. Is it a uh, unifocal or posifocal disease, as such as you might see in to toxoplasmosis, or multifocal, as you might see in certain types of herpetic infections? And then, are the vessels involved? Uh, certain, certain types of UV disease will affect the veins more than the arteries. Uh, and then, is the optic nerve involved? Is this a neuroretinitis, because your differential diagnosis for a neuroretinitis will uh, be different than it is for other infectious uh, etiologies? Laterality is important uh, in that many infectious UV disease will present unilaterally. For example, uh, necrotizing herpetic retinitis frequently will present unilaterally, although it may become uh, bilateral. Toxoplasmosis, toxoparesis are frequently unilateral. Uh, uh, other associated signs on the examination, such as elevated intraocular pressure, stigmata of herpetic infections, such as sectoral iris atrophy, corneal scarring, can give you a clue to the diagnosis. But laterality is obviously not always helpful, as there are some patients with B27-associated uveitis that can present with, with hypopion uveitis. The differential diagnosis, I like to think of it in just broad categories. Is it viral? Uh, is it commonly viral, such as herpes? That would be the most common thing. And then less common uh, uh, infections, such as emerging infections, uh, depending upon where, the, where in the world the patient might be coming from. Uh, bacterial in infections, fungal infections, uh, particularly endogenous type of fungal infections, uh, protozoal infections such as toxoplasmosis, and then helminthic. Uh, intraocular fluid uh, and tissue sampling is very important, particularly in uh, presentations in which it is really difficult to just make the diagnosis based on pattern recognition. So in the case uh, up here, this no one would uh, mistake this for uh, diagnosis of toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis, or in an immunocompromised patient, uh, in the uh, correct clinical context, this is CMV retinitis. However, you cannot tell just by looking at this what this might be, and in immunocompromised patients, this could be many different uh, diagnoses, as is this uh, multifocal subretinal infiltrates in an elderly patient could represent infection, it could represent non-infectious UVIs or malignancy. So that in uh, UV it is in which the etiology is unclear or the, the um, uh, response to therapy is atypical uh, or the systemic workup is an inconclusive, intraocular fluid analysis either from the anterior chamber of the vitreous or sampling the retina or the cori can be helpful in distinguishing between an intraocular infection or a malignancy where the differential between this is extremely important in terms of treating the patient and may impact on the systemic health of the patient. Um, therapeutic principles, um, obviously you do not want to treat an infection with steroids uh, without appropriate specific antibi uh, antibiotic cover. Uh, 
Um, the basic principle is to think about this in a broad differential diagnosis. So if you see a patient with um, a uh, indeterminate diagnosis, um, you will obtain uh, laboratory testing uh, and you will uh, maybe sample their vitreous or their anterior chamber, but you want to treat broadly and treat the infection that could most likely uh, destroy the eye, frequently treating with multi-antimicrobial uh, treatment and then withdrawing therapy as your laboratory uh, and laboratories become uh, available or more information becomes available on the patient. Corticosteroids are useful, particularly topically, to treat inflammation, but should never be used as monotherapy in patients with infectious uveitis. That being said, corticosteroids can be very helpful in treating the uh, inflammatory component of infectious uh, diseases after the appropriate installation uh, and, and commencement of antimicrobial therapy. In general, we do not treat uh, intravitreal with intravitreal steroids, uh, as this can uh, result in you know, unbridled uh, viral replication. And then, it is always important to reevaluate your your patient uh, uh, on a regular basis and reconsider your diagnosis if they are not responding in the way that you think. So, our first presenter is going to be uh, Dr. Shakur. We have the. Uh, Honor of our entire UBI's division presenting here, so I hope you enjoy this. Thanks, Mr. Thank you. Uh, where'd the computer go? All right, now I have to lower the mic. Al has a little bit of a height advantage here. But um, I'm going to present uh, a couple of patients, but the first one is, uh, is a resident, uh, I'm sorry, a fellowship nightmare. Uh, we've all had a few of those, and this one, we really were at a loss of, uh, as to how we could have proceeded differently. A 61-year-old gentleman, um, African American with a history of systemic sarcoidosis presented to us in California in 2010, in August. Um, and for two months, he had a history of blurry vision and photophobia in the left eye. And he'd been diagnosed a few weeks earlier by a local ophthalmologist with anterior uveitis. He's diabetic, hypertensive, has gout, uh, chronic renal disease. And in late 2005, he complained of progressive fatigue, ataxia, falling, and confusion. He's diagnosed with neurosarcoidosis based on a thoracoscopic biopsy of his hilar lymph nodes, um, which showed non kz in granulomas. He came in with hydrocephalus, meningoencephalitis, and a lymphocytic predominant pleocytosis. He was initially treated with uh, steroids and uh, methotrexate at a fairly low dose. And in 2007, began to have worsening pulmonary sarcoid with restrictive lung disease. Uh, in 2009, he was started uh, on treatment with Celsept to a final dose of three grams a day. And he began to uh, develop cardiac conduction abnormal uh, anomalies that would presume secondary to sarcoidosis. Don't forget to check people's hearts when they have sarcoid. His past ocular history was really only significant for cataract extraction in the past and um, a history of zoster to the first division of the trigeminal nerve on the left side. His examination was significant for uh, a little bit of a afferent pupillary defect which I thought may just be my imagination. And for the residents, which appendage is this? <laughs> Anybody? Ashley? No. Yes, and what do you see on the nose? <laughs> uh, it looks like there's some uh, tissue that looks like the vascular and the Yeah, so it's a nodular kind of uh, dermal, post-dermal rash. Uh, and what do you call this in sarcoidosis? Anybody? Lupus pernia. It's very good. Yeah, so this is very good. So, so this is lupus pernia, which is a 
have a hallmark of uh, cutaneous sarcoidosis. He had that. Um, his anterior chamber showed one plus cell, three plus flare. He had one plus cell in his anterior vitreous and a lot of haze. So, and you can see a little bit of uh, posterior vitreous cell in the OCT on both sides. He's diagnosed with anterior and intermediate uveitis, likely secondary to sarcoidosis with a small, small afferent pupillary defect. Um, his infectious labs were negative, so a few days later we injected him with a subtenon scanlog in the left side. He was seen in follow-up. He uh, reported improvement in his photophobia, but no improvement in vision. And now, although his vision was the same at 2200, he now has a 1.2 log afferent pupillary defect. And um, I cannot stress how important it is to actually measure an afferent pupillary defect. Judith Warner and I would agree on one thing here. Um, but <laughs> measure them because they do change. And when they change, it's important to image. His cell has improved, his uveitis has improved. His OCT shows a little bit of swelling. But we recommended an MRI to look at his optic nerve. This gentleman does have neurosarcoidosis. Um, Lee, uh, what do you see on this MRI? Is, this, is part of his brain missing, or is this something else? Well, it looks like that, but it's actually uh, it's a flow artifact from his uh, uh, ventricular shunt. So when things flow rapidly uh, in, in T1, you end up with a, a, a void, a flow void. Anyway, that's just cool. And then his optic nerve over here, this prechiasmal optic nerve, you can see a little bit of contrast enhancement. So he was diagnosed with an optic neuropathy in consultation with our neuro-ophthalmology neuro colleagues in San Francisco and with neurology, we presumed that this was sarcoid optic neuropathy. He was treated with IV solumedrol for five days, started on Remicade a week later, continued on Celsept, and transitioned to oral prednisone at 60 milligrams. His vision continued to decline until two days later, he was no light perception in the left eye. Bad. And then he disappeared for a month. And when he comes back a month later, he complains of decreased vision in his right eye, as well as unsteadiness of gait. He is now no light perception and 2040 in the right eye. He's got a complete afferent pupillary defect. And what do we see here? Conradi. Yeah. So whitening of the retina. But what do you see in somebody with uveitis? Would you expect such a clear view? No, right? So that's something to keep a note of. And you can see in the periphery, he's got areas of retinal whitening here as well. And his OCT, Chris, if you can tell me where the location of the whitening is. So the inner retina. So you can see like there's a complete loss of retinal architecture over here. So could this be sarcoid panuveitis? That's unlikely on so much immunosuppression. And you certainly don't expect to see retinal whitening. Could it be viral retinitis? So we performed a vitreous tap. We admitted him to neurology for IV acyclovir. Uh, uh, lumbar puncture was also performed. And this PCR of his vitreous and CSF was positive for varicella zoster virus. We recommended stopping the solumedrol and switching from IV acyclovir to gancyclovir and foscarnet. And we started intravitreal injections of gancyclovir and foscarnet alternating at high dose. Unfortunately, over the next three days, he continued to progr uh, progress, and this retinal whitening is now splitting his fovea. So this is a gentleman with systemic sarcoidosis presenting initially as neurosarcoidosis. He has anterior and intermediate uveitis. 
He has retrobulbar optic neuropathy. He was presumptively treated with high-dose steroid and immunomodulatory therapy, as you would in somebody with neurosarcoid and optic neuropathy. And he ends up with a necrotizing herpetic retinitis in the right eye and worsening optic neuritis in the left. So optic neuropathy in an immunocompromised uh, person with neurosarcoidosis, and this is progressive outer retinal necrosis in a patient with severe autoimmune disease with an iatrogenic component. So progressive outer retinal necrosis um, is a rapidly progressive necrotizing retinal uh, retinitis, usually caused by varicella zoster virus in about 70% and 30% caused by herpes simplex 1 or 2. It's typically seen in patients with a CD4 count of less than 50. Visual outcomes are poor. This, is, uh, this has an abysmal prognosis, even with antiviral therapy. It's been reported in other immunocompromised states as well, including after bone marrow transplant, after lymphoma, after high-dose steroid, and classically seen in patients with HIV and AIDS. It's been reported as well just a few years before I saw my patient when optic neuropathy, which was presumed to be inflammatory in nature, ended up being infectious and treated with systemic corticosteroids. This is a patient treated by Dr. Davis at Bascom Palmer. So was the optic neuropathy secondary to sarcoidosis of varicella zoster? I think we very well proved to ourselves that it was infectious, unfortunately. How do we treat this patient without exacerbating his systemic disease? Neurology did not want to stop uh, steroids, did not want to stop Remicade, and did not want to stop Celsept. Cardiology didn't want to either. This patient was quite ill. Um, with that level of immunosuppression, treatment of this patient's eyes is doomed to fail. What's his prognosis? Well, I can tell you now, five years later, he's still 2040, but his visual field is less than five degrees. So necrotizing viral retinitis include acute retinal necrosis, progressive outer retinal necrosis, and CMV retinitis. I'll leave out the last three in the interest of uh, the last one in the interest of time. This is a 54-year-old gentleman referred to us some years back for iritis. Um, when you look in the back, you can see that there's a little bit more going on. Um, Eric, you're going to be my fellow next year, so I might as well pick on you. What do you see here? So kind of this retinal whitening in the periphery, multiple foci started to become confluent uh, with some hemorrhage, but not a lot. So this is acute retinal necrosis. It's a necrotizing retinitis caused by herpes simplex or varicella zoster. <coughs> Patients with RN are usually immunocompromised, but it may also be seen in uh, immunocompetent, but it may be seen in the immunocompromised. Patients come in with hot eyes, moderate to significant vitritis, optic disc edema, and an optic neuropathy if not treated promptly. Bilaterality will happen in 70% after, after a month. It's a clinical diagnosis, but it can be fortified by using PCR for, verse, uh, for the herpes uh, viruses and for toxoplasma because there is a uh, atypical toxoplasma with retinitis that can mimic uh, on. Conventionally, you treat this with IV acyclovir. Uh, without treatment, there will be involvement in 20 to 70 percent in the other eye. Systemic acyclovir reduces that risk to, uh, to, six, uh, to 13 percent. Other treatment protocols, the one that I favor, uh, um, uh, oral valacyclovir to a dose of two grams three times a day gives you IV equivalent levels. Uh, intravitreal gancyclovir or intravitreal foscarnet may be used. Oral prednisone may be added. Aspirin may be associated with better visual outcomes. Late findings do include 
uh, pigmentary changes, retinal detachment does happen in about 70%. Barricade, la barricade laser, however, is controversial, uh, and retinal detachment is complicated. Lots of PVR, you need a buckle, you need oil. Here's a uh, arm retina that seems to be clearing a little bit. You can see that the, there's perivascular clearing of the um, retinitis, and ultimately, this progresses into kind of this Swiss cheese appearance with pigmentary changes, resolving retinitis, and that's why they get retinal detachments. Here's a 34-year-old patient with HIV and a CD4 count uh, at 10. Um, you can see a lot of retinal whitening, a little bit of blood, but not very much. But what stands out here is how clear the view is. The absence of vitritis may makes you think about immunocompromised states. This is progressive outer retinal necrosis. A better example, a more typical example than the patient I presented in the beginning. This is a herpetic uh, retinitis in immunocompromised patients with rapidly progressive multifocal lesions, lower level of vitritis and vasculitis, and whereas ARN spreads rapidly, this um, spreads like, well, like nobody's business. This, uh, this can wipe out the entire retina in a couple of days. The treatment for this is either a cyclovir foscarnate or gancyclovir. IV th treatment is recommended. High dose intravitreal uh, gancyclovir foscarnate or their combination, and these progress despite treatment. So, in conclusion, remember viral retinitis is not always something you see uh, that you did not cause. A viral retinitis can be iatrogenic. Uh, we do immunosuppress more and more patients. Uh, in this era, and do look for infectious UV entities in the immunocompromised. And then most importantly, just as a uh, kind of a wide statement, always dilate the pupil in an eye with uveitis. Anterior uveitis is often not anterior. Thank you to the photographers.